Um, I think we now move mm. to uh, to Anders Dutoy to to for uh, maybe a, a more uh, a more negative story about when tr struggle transformation doesn't happen. Yes, thanks very much. Do I get a thing to click my um, presentation? So thank you. Sure. Well, we'll learn by trial and error how this works. Um, I, I I think I should have called my presentation structural transformation. You're doing it wrong. Uh -huh. um, uh, the, to tell the truth, when I got to the invitation, I, I, I was un unsure what I was doing on the panel because South Africa isn't a lo low-income country. It, it may be an imaginary country, indeed I often think so, but it's definitely not low-income. And I'm not a development economist, I'm a rural sociologist. So uh, um, the angle from which I ap approach these debates is very, very different from what you've just heard. But I do think South Africa is an interesting case in, in a way, precisely how structural transformation can go wrong or not happen, and what, what, what you should and should not do about it. So, so I'm not, I don't have very many, many, many answers to the, to the questions. I, can, I think the South African case is a very good example for, for why you need structural transformation if you are to avoid serious inequality can, am I coming through. Is that all right? Is it working? Yeah. Um, and I'll uh, look very broadly, uh, very briefly, at some of the challenges facing agricultural and rural development policy in relation to structural transformation. And then if I have time at the end, I'll say a few things about some of the ways in which we are trying to address these issues uh, in my institute, the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies. Uh, very, very modest and, and, and experimental in the, in the good sense of the word. Um, so without more, more ado, I'll just you know, try to, oh, it's working. Um, I'll just try to say, uh, say a few things about the, the difficulties that we are experiencing in South Africa with structural transformation. This uh, pyramid you see there is from uh, uh, Jeremy Seeklings and, and, and Nicolae Natris's book on uh, race, class, and inequality in South Africa. And it gives you the stock facts about the distribution of income inequality in the country, what uh, they call an upper class, 12% of the households garnering 45% of the household income. Um, uh, a, a core working class, petty traders, etc., 48% uh, of the household gaining 45% of the income, and then what they call a marginal working class, um, about 45% of the households gaining about 41% 40, um, uh, of, uh, of the households gaining 10% of the income. Um, and the scary thing about this pyramid is that it's proved uh, really resistant to change in the 15 to 17 years since the end of apartheid. In fact, uh, although we've managed to uh, do something to ameliorate extreme poverty, inequality has worsened and uh, seeklings and natures, this marginal working class seem to be permanently stuck on the margins of the economy, uh, unable to participate effectively in that economy, unemployed, actually not even necessary as labor in the economy, maybe necessary as voters, necessary as consumers, but uh, not uh, effective as economic agents in the economy. Um, and some of the reasons why this has proved to be so resistant to changes, of course, is that the causes uh, go much deeper than apartheid. The causes relate to the, the, the basic growth path of the South African economy well before apartheid, since the beginning of the 20th century, very much based around the mineral energy complex. Um, and in the last few decades, uh, characterized by the development of a very particular kind of core economy, the very, very big, um, powerful service and retail sector characterized by spatially extensive supply, so distribution and supply chains, um, very, very effective, very vertically integrated, which creates enormous <coughs> problems for rural development and for new entrants into the economy. And I just think about it. If you're a poor person, uh, either living in one of the former homelands or in a, a typical South African townshi township, a, you don't have very much land, so you're unable to really secure your own household food security through your own efforts. B, the formal economy doesn't need or want you, so you're unable to get the money you need to buy your food uh, from wage labor. C, if you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur, you are 
far away from the markets where the money is. And uh, in your own markets, for the little bit of money that there is, you are competing head-to-head -head with uh, some of the most efficient and effective retail organizations in the Southern Hemisphere. So I'm always a bit baffled by the, the um, missionaries for the fortune at the base of the pyramid in South Africa. The South African big corporations, ShopRite, Spar, Celsi, know about the fortune and in the base of the pyramid, and they're already there. Whatever space there might be for rural, rural entrepreneurs to move into has in many ways already been taken. So it's a very, very hostile environment for for um, the informal sector, whether in the for urban or in the uh, rural areas. Um, I'm going to say a few things about how all this plays in relation to my institute's um, uh, area of endeavor, um, uh, rural and uh, agricultural policy. 1994, the problem was really clear. Uh, we had an agricultural sector composed of about 60,000 white farmers who farmed more than 80% of the land, it was clearly not politically tenable. It was also uh, not economically very efficient. So our plan was uh, uh, very simple. What we'll do is we'll go through a process of deregulation well in advance of what was required by GATT. Uh, South Africa now has levels of support to agriculture, I think probably some of the lowest in the world. I think Australia and New Zealand may, may beat us there. The idea is that uh, you'll drive the ineffective white farmers uh, out of the market, you'll bring down land prices, and you'll have uh, the, the elements of a cheap food policy that will help you increase real urban wages and allow all kinds of other good things. Uh, now that's, well, it's not happened. Um, at the moment what we have in South Africa is uh, the number of commercial farming units have halved. So now there are 30,000 white farmers on the land, more or less. So, so the, the, the policy did succeed in driving uh, the less effective uh, white family farmers out of business, but the people, people who benefited from it were not the upcoming smallholder black farmers. It's been agribusiness and the even bigger white farmers. So we currently have an enormously concentrated agricultural sector. I think of the 30, between 30 and 40,000 commercial farming units that we have, the 3,000 biggest farmers produce 40% of the country's food. And I think the, ne the next 30% produce about 75% of the rest. I don't have the exact figures. Um, so, so, this, so, so we have not been able to, to transform our agrarian structure. Um, Large-scale commercial farming plus supermarkets plus um, social grants have enabled us to achieve food security of some degree in the towns. So poor people with money have been able to meet their caloric requirements, but at the expense of dietary quality. And this is an <coughs> issue that I think is quite underemphasized in the literature, and it's actually an emerging issue in debates about food security in South Africa. Um, um, we currently in South Africa have the very interesting situation where we simultaneously have uh, uh, severe problems of undernutrition, so we still have very high levels of wasting and stunting and so on. But we also have a growing uh, crisis of overnutrition, a rising burden of uh, non-communicable diseases related to diet, diabetes, obesity, uh, cardiac uh, disease and so on often in the same communities and in the same households as the places where the undernutrition exists. And what is driving this is that the big supermarkets and the big food processors who, who have made the cheap calories possible have, have done this by putting into the township food that is cheap, tasty, and bad for you. Um, highly processed, high in sodium, very refined, added sugar, etc. So we now have a um, um, public health time bomb coming our way in South Africa with huge uh, implications for health costs and so on. So this is a bit of a bit of an aside. Um, and to top it all up, this is um, it's, it's economically not a sustainable situation. It's certainly a politically very very unstable situation because in a situation where poverty persists, this kind of uh, fact where 
30,000 white farmers still own even more of the land than they did before is, is, uh, is um, something that certain politicians really will have a field day with. So the question is, what, what do you do about this? Um, well, there's a number of... I need to get this thing to work. Now, do I point it in a certain direction? or? Um, um, so, I mean, there are a number of proposals about what to do about this. We've had an example north of our borders. We've had a very radical process of structural transformation, but in the other direction. Um, uh, jury's out, and there's a lot of debate about the, the, the benefits and the downsides of Robert Mugabe's fast-track land reform. But uh, in South Africa, it's a very dubious proposition. For one thing, you can't achieve it without uh, going through a fair amount of very violent social conflict and political repression. And in a country like South Africa, where a large part of your uh, uh, poor are urban and dependent on food that they can buy in shops, it's, uh, it's unclear whether this is going to produce uh, the result that, that we want. So since 2008, there's been a big push towards supporting smallholders in South African agricultural policy. Um, and for an organization like PLAS, which really uh, has been trying to support uh, smallholder development, this is good news. But our question is really why? Why do you want to support smallholder agricultural development? Um, according to our Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, what they want to do is to rekindle the black class of black commercial farmers, which was destroyed by the Natives Land Act of 1913. In other words, turn the clock back and try to embark on a political project which is certainly impossible in the context of our current food, highly supermarketized food system. Or um, uh, another way of approaching it is seeing land reform and smallholder development as a process of supporting uh, diverse livelihood portfolios. And it's very, very important in the South African context to understand that almost all poor, poor livelihoods are both rural and urban. Poor people living in the town townships are highly dependent on the social safety net provided by their rural family. Rural people in the deep rural areas are dependent on the remittances coming from the urban area. You can't look at one without the other. So any kind of smallholder development that we want to, want to support has got to um, be able to, to not try to put a class of gentlemen farmers, for some reason they're always male in the fantasies of, of uh, South African agricultural economists on the land, but uh, to support these diverse uh, rural livelihoods. So um, just, th and this is a difficult task given the nature of the, the food system as I've just explained to you. So uh, I'll just um, conclude with a little bit of an advertisement uh, for one of our projects in, in PLOS where we're trying to engage with this reality. And in a way, one of the things that we, we've said to ourselves is a lot of the important policy in this area is not made by governments. A lot of the policy in this is made in the private sector by the private sector players, particularly by the, by the supermarkets. At the same time, we're in a situation in South Africa now where you can't open the farmers weekly without hearing about a new scheme, a new partnership between a supermarket and a bunch of small farmers somewhere, uh, some kind of uh, corporates. Some of it is smoke and mirrors. Some of it is really, really interesting, uh, innovative, um, uh, realistic um, experimentation. So one can, at the moment, think about South Africa as a kind of like gigantic laboratory. It's not RCTs. Uh, it's a lot messier and more complicated than this, but there's a lot of innovation happening. Uh, so um, we are in partnership with an organization called the Southern Africa Food Lab, which convenes what they call social dialogues, where role players in the food system are brought together to talk about what South, Af South African Food Lab calls pro-poor value chain management. So how do all of us players in the food chain engage our practices, our food standards, our traceability standards, etc., to ensure that we create a food system that is environmentally sustainable, which creates jobs where the economy needs it, and which delivers healthy and nutritious food to poor people. So uh, it's very interesting. We've managed to get the, the big supermarkets into the room. They all are full of good intentions. Even uh, Walmart is in the room there. Um, in the guise of Mass Mart. It's very, um, 
early days. I'm not really sure um, uh, where it's going to end up. It wasn't uh, Chairman Mao who said it. It was Shirin Lai, and it wasn't about the French Revolution. It was about the Paris uprisings. But he, he said it all. It's too early to tell. And uh, in a few years, we'll be able to <laughs> tell you what the outcomes of our <laughs> experimentation is. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much indeed, Andres. Um, so this discussion about a st stalled agrarian transition and uh, potentially what to do about it in terms of value chain, chain development. Um,